and we all may have different values and ideas and living our lives in different ways, but there's a lot in common, a lot more in common between all of us than there is different. I feel like that's something that's sorely missing. I was made fun of as, you like a goody two-shoes, uh, Bible thumper. Uh, square, old-fashioned, savages. They were gonna brainwash me. Rich or greedy. Uneducated. Towelhead and a raghead, a Middle Easterner and an Arab. Those messages do tremendous damage, spiritually, to people. I'm a Christian, uh, non-denominational. I practice the Sikh religion, S-I-K-H. I'm a Muslim. Christian. Interfaith. The term that I would use is called yeshivish. Cradle Episcopalian. I'm a Jesus follower. Baptist born, Baptist bred, and when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. <laughs> The challenge is people think they know who I am based on what they see on television or in film or, or wherever else they get their information, but they're all assumptions and they're usually wrong. People's understanding of religion is really shaped by media and they don't understand the social impact that popular media has. We have really well-documented evidence that when the show 24, which was a terrorism-related show, was on air, the next day you would see a spike in reports of Islamophobic hate crimes. Growing up, you can't help but internalize a lot of those narratives that you're going to look like the other and you're going to be discriminated against. What the media gets wrong is they don't see the full person. They don't see the full community. They see a stereotype and then they produce media about the stereotype, but they're missing the vast majority of everybody else. Religion is a very important part of my upbringing, the backbone of my development. I don't think I've ever seen anything in the media that depicted the type of experience that I had growing up. I never really saw myself um, like reflected in, in the movies. Religion is an aspect of our lives that permeates every major issue. And not every reporter is trained to understand how to think about and cover religion. I do believe that there are journalists, many journalists, who would take that opportunity to learn if they had it in front of them. And they aren't sure where to start and often either don't see how religion fits in to the story or they're not sure how to do it and get afraid and step away from it. And in both cases, we do a disservice to how we tell these stories. One of the knock-on effects of the, these portrayals is I think it probably fragments our culture, our society more. If someone is other, then it's very easy to, uh, number one, you don't want to learn from them. Number two, you don't want to be around them. And number three, it's very easy then to hurt them. Yeah, anytime someone becomes the other, it's, it's a very dangerous thing. I was a senior in high school when the terrorist attacks of 9-11 happened. And we were watching the TV screens uh, in Texas in our high school. And we watched the Twin Towers come down. And after about half an hour, no one had spoken. And, and one of the anchors said, we think we have the primary suspect. And they fat flashed an image on the screen. And it was a person I'd never heard of before, uh, but he looked a lot like me. I mean, he didn't look anything like me, but I saw his turban, and I saw his beard, and I saw his brown skin. I was like, oh my god, my life is never going to be the same again. And, and I was right. And the death threat started that afternoon. We as humans are going to experience suffering. This is a, a huge way that a lot of people get through it. Oftentimes, you know, you see religion depicted as something to try to get money from people or, you know, to, to manipulate and take advantage of people, which certainly does go on, you know, but I think the transformative nature of religion should be depicted a bit more in the media, and I don't think it is. Whether it's Islam, whether it's Christianity, Judaism, whichever faith you follow, it, um, it, it provides a, a, a set of values, a value of how you view your life, how you view the world, how you view your role as a, a person in this world. Very often still, that, that converse, public conversation gets framed as uh, 
people of faith on one side versus queer people over, over here. That's just, that's, a, that's just a false binary that we need to disrupt. So all of that, all of that has to do with sort of shifting the frame. And I hope giving folks in the media a different way to think about how to frame that, that conversation. Do we want to tell stories that sow division, or do we want to tell stories that cultivate divinity and the shared divinity among us, whatever we call that? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Dritan Nesho of Harris X. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending today. It's a pleasure to share with you the inaugural findings of the Global Faith and Media Index, which is a massive study that we conducted together with the Faith and Media Initiative and the Radiant uh, Foundation over the course of the last 45 days across 18 different countries, 9,500 respondents, the men and women uh, on the street uh, of all different types of faiths and uh, denominations, or even uh, atheistic and uh, non-believing, as well as 35 journalists um, in newsrooms across the world. And the goal of the study is meant to surface in the words of journalists themselves and in the words of readers ac across the globe, how faith and media is treated or uh, improperly treated in some cases, uh, and how these different stakeholders, which are part and parcel of the global public square, are reacting uh, to uh, issues and topics that relate to uh, coverage of faith and uh, religion across the world. The study was conducted across all major faiths and religions around the world. The study was also uh, conducted in six uh, languages across six different continents. And as you'll see in the next slide, these are just a little bit of the statistics around uh, the study, but the bottom line is that uh, this is as uh, robust and representative as anything that has been done to date. And in fact, looking at the intersection of media and faith and religion, it's quite unique and makes it a first of its kind uh, study. In addition to the geographical diversity and the broad representativeness of the data, uh, we also wanted to capture uh, a set of countries with very different faith and religious based profiles. And this is part of our index. Uh, we see that on a global basis, the global average, 56% of the respondents said that they were quite faithful and quite religious. But there's significant variance we have more secular countries like the UK, Spain, France on one extreme, and more faithful countries like the United States, South Africa, and Nigeria in the other extreme. And there are middle of the road countries like Mexico and China that were, are representative uh, and represented in the findings of the study. And one of the interesting things of the findings, which we'll get to in just a second, is the consistency of the findings. Usually in global studies like this, the data is quite hard to read, quite hard to make sense. In this case, the data was more, uh, uh, fell together in a very, very uh, seamless way. And if you'll uh, humor me, I want to get some of the top line findings correctly. So the first thing is that faith and religion is a major aspect of personal identity around the world. In our study, 82% of the respondents identified as spiritual, faithful, or having some kind of religious affiliation. So this is not a study about something that's not part and parcel of human experience and human nature, but rather the opposite, about something that affects over eight in 10 people around the globe on a day-to-day -day basis and on a very consistent basis. At the same time, what was surprising in the, in the overall findings is that journalists within uh, newsrooms, again in 17 plus countries, felt that the coverage of faith and religion was becoming more and more marginalized and less a particular focus of the work that they are doing in the newsroom. 
And there's a series of factors that are leading to that phenomenon, which we'll get to um, in a second. And in a similar fashion, this is something that's going on and being noticed by readers around the world. 53% of our respondents said that the media, they feel, actively ignores religion as an aspect of society and culture today. 59% said that it's important that the news media covers a much more diverse set of faith and religious perspectives. And 63% of people globally said that quality content is needed uh, within each of their countries. So these are striking findings, majority findings. And the data is also very constructive, but also points to a set of challenges and work to be done. 61% across the globe said that media perpetuates stereotypes around faith and religion, a striking finding, rather than actively fighting them. 78% believe that such stereotypes must be dealt at the same level or even on a higher level than gender and uh, race stereotypes. So they are elevating the treatment of faith and religion to the highest cadre of what are known as the family of DNI issues, issues of representativeness, issues of uh, equity, and uh, it's, it's a very, very important finding. And over eight in 10 also believe that faith organizations have to do a better job at providing more appropriate representatives, less spokespeople with talking points, and much more representatives that look like the men and women on the street and can speak to shared experiences and life experiences to help address uh, this point. So as we unpack this data, there's a series of findings that we'll be uh, looking at, and they all point to a series of um, next steps that have to be done, or at least readers around the world want to be done to address the issues that we are uh, seeing. So what is going on in the newsrooms to marginalize the coverage of faith and religion? Um, the 35 plus uh, journalists that we spoke to, and they were of different levels, reporters, editors, making decisions on content within the newsroom, and even decision makers on a corporate level uh, across the world, they pointed to at least five factors that they, are, they believe have led to the current state of coverage around faith and religion. The first one is newsroom economics, and then the way that they put it is that Squeezed budgets have, left, uh, have, have led to less specialists covering these topics of faith and religion, and more generalists doing so. In turn, generalists are much more concerned about getting it wrong, and getting coverage of faith and religion wrong is something that comes at a very high cost within the newsroom and outside of the newsroom. Uh, diversity and newsroom dynamics were uh, at play as well. Journalists tended to indicate that newsrooms tend to be secular in nature and you don't want to introduce any qualitative element of coverage or potentially, as I said, of bias. And that's why they skirt faith and religious angles and faith and religious uh, reporting. There's the clicks for controversy uh, component. Uh, unfortunately, today's uh, media engagement gets driven a lot more by sensational stories and uh, stories that are dealing with controversies rather than the softer human interest stories that define the experience of faith and religion around the world on a day-to-day -day basis. And obviously many of these journalists actually lack access to good uh, sp uh, spokespeople uh, that can speak to the subject that they are addressing uh, within, within the newsroom. So a series of factors that come together to affect both the quality and the volume of coverage of faith and religion uh, across the globe. And what was striking about this finding was the forthright nature within which journalists answered the questions that we asked them. And they were very open that this is an issue within the newsroom, but they were also uh, resigned to it. And the challenge that this presents is in the words of one senior editor, you can't serve what you don't see, or you can't serve what you don't actively acknowledge. And this is part of the, uh, part of the elements that we are seeing at play. So there's a series of <coughs> consistent themes uh, here, and we surface them in the voice uh, of journalists themselves. Unfortunately, they're too small uh, to see, but I'll just read you some of the quotes to highlight what we heard within the newsroom. In the UK, a senior journalist told us that religion is just peripheral, to be honest. 
my perception is that it kind of crops up in this rather slightly kind of marginal corners of journalism. <clears throat> well, how could it be when it affects 82% of people on a day-to-day -day basis? In the United States, a senior journalist says that it's usually covered as a feature of conservative politics, as if faith and religion is not an element of moderates, independents, and liberals within the country. But I think this is very revealing, uh, these quotes. And another journalist said, you know, I don't cover such stories because you never know uh, when you're offending someone and the costs for that are too great. And this was a journalist uh, in Kenya. So highlighting some of the same themes that we were addressing up until now. And, you know, in a similar, um, in a similar vein, um, there is this distinction that is drawn between a hard news stories and soft news stories. And I won't uh, take too long with the quotes, but fundamentally journalists uh, tended to have a bit of a bias that hard news stories were only about events that deal with everything from abuses within the churches to issues of politics that are being affected by religion, including all the way to terrorism, and issues that were controversial. Never did they comment on, on positive news story as, as hard news angles that they could re, uh, report to, as they say, factually. And I think that this is also a bias within the coverage that um, it's, it was inherent in a lot of the conversations uh, that we had. And then the final set of issues, um, and again, we will have this uh, findings for you to pick up on your way out, were really what drives engagement with news stories. And again, there is this inherent bias, and I'll explain why I'm calling it bias uh, in a second, in the words of readers across the globe, that these news stories don't really drive uh, visibility, don't really drive engagement, don't really drive the type of um, uh, the type of uh, interaction that the newsrooms are looking for within their readers. And that's far away from the story that we're seeing. So this is a little bit of what people are saying across the globe. The first striking finding from the men and women on the street answering our survey questions is that one in th three global respondents follow media sources that focus exclusively almost on faith-based and religious-based news. And in more faithful and religious countries, that number grows to 47%. So there's an opportunity inherent in this because this is actually a, a, a very large swath of readers that want to see this type of uh, data and this type of coverage and information. 63% said that there's a need for high quality content on faith and religion. We looked at this from uh, many angles. There's also strong agreement that the media needs to cover a more diverse set of faith and religious perspectives. And again, this was a majority opinion in all, uh, across the study. And 56% say that they are more likely, and this is an important data point, to engage with the publication with high quality faith and religious reporting. So addressing many of the issues that we saw in the newsroom is actually uh, good uh, citizenship, but also good business because all of the data that we collected shows that readers across, across the globe in the United States and beyond, the majority of them want more coverage of uh, faith and religious issues and actually more complex coverage uh, of the same. So, one back. So, looking at the challenges, um, a majority, 61%, said that they believe that media perpetuates faith based stereotypes especially around uh, uh, you know, the hard topics that they cover. This is a very striking finding, and it's a very consistent finding, as you can see, across the globe. Uh, and as I mentioned, 78% believe that these types of stereotypes should have the same or more attention as race and gender stereotypes. And when we asked in the finding, how are you affected by this, 43% said that they are often anxious about what they read around faith and religion, especially their own faith and their own religion and how they feel that is uh, mis, uh, misrepresented. We looked a little bit at the most perpetuated stereotypes that exist out there, um, holding back the advancement of women, especially within religious organizations is one of those stereotypes, being against 
LGBTQ rights and issues was one of those stereotypes. And then everything from abro uh, abuse to polarization and extremism uh, perpetuated. 81% of all respondents identified or could select one of the stereotypes that they were uh, 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 shown and whether or not they had encountered it uh, recently. And again, 84% also pointed the way to religious organizations needing to do more. Uh, so this is not just about, um, about the newsroom. Uh, this is not just about what is shared on social media, but this is also an issue of access. And over 8 in 10 said that more diverse representatives were needed so that they could associate with these uh, uh, representatives. So to sum it all up, uh, the data presents an opportunity around the space, the better coverage of faith and religion, a challenge with all the issues of stereotyping that we see that are going wrong, and also several steps towards a path forward. What can be addressed within coverage and within the newsroom, and what also they expect faith-based organizations to do uh, to address some of these issues. Uh, so with that, I think we are done with the data presentation, and uh, I'd like to invite the rest of the panelists who will have a discussion around uh, uh, this topic. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. We have an amazing group here to discuss this further. I would like to start with a question that would be completely inappropriate in any other forum but here makes perfect sense. And I wanna do that as part of the introductions. So we're gonna start on the end. So your name, your title, and do you consider yourself a person of faith? And if so, what's your faith background? Yeah, so, uh, and actually I think it's interesting to say it would be inappropriate in any other place. And that's maybe something we can discuss why. Uh, but I'm Davis Smith, I'm the founder and CEO of Cotopaxi, an outdoor gear brand that uh, supports poverty alleviation around the world. I am a person of faith. I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sometimes called the Mormons. I'm Alyssa Wilkinson. I am a senior culture reporter at Vox.com, and I'm also an associate professor at the King's College downtown, which is a small Christian college. Um, I grew up in a, I would say, very, very conservative evangelical um, family, and I'm an Episcopalian now. Um, hello, my name is Anna Molinado Mims. I am I function as a fractional CMO, which is what my business has been doing for the last 12 years uh, in various organizations. I'm also an adjunct in, at NYU. Um, I am a Christian, a born again Christian. We talked about evangelical or born again, but that's what I am. I'm a, I'm a Christian. All right, my name is Linus Idahosa. I am the CEO and founder of a company called Del York International. And we also have an international film and media academy for those in the broadcast industry across Africa. I am a Christian. I am a follower of Jesus. Hi, Simranjit Singh, uh, executive director for the Aspen Institute's Religion and Society program. Uh, also a visiting professor at Union Seminary where I teach Buddhist history. Um, I am a practicing Sikh. Uh, hello, my name is Kurosh Siabari. Um, I'm from Iran. Uh, I live in the city of Rashi, northern Iran. Um, I'm the correspondent and reporter with Asia Times and also a contributor to Foreign Policy and the New Arab and the recipient of a Chivening Award from the UK's Foreign Office. Uh, I am a person of faith. I'm a practicing Muslim and uh, I guess uh, there's a lot of potential to discuss um, how um, Islam is portrayed in the mainstream media these days. Good afternoon, my name is David Miller. I'm on the faculty of Princeton University. I run a research center uh, called the Faith and Work Initiative that looks at all faith traditions and how they might shape, uh, shape and inform people's ethics, their leadership, their decision making. Uh, I'm a former investment banker and who then went to the study theology and uh, have my PhD in ethics. So I try to combine those two worlds. Uh, as far as my uh, faith identity, uh, complicated, confused. Uh, my family has a mixture of uh, uh, Jewish uh, people, Catholic people, um, atheists, agnostics, and where I have landed is uh, in the Presbyterian tradition. Thank you. 
And I'm Dritan Nesho, uh, the CEO of HarrisX, which does global public opinion research. Um, I was born in communist Albania, uh, where religion was outlawed, uh, but also a country that has a multi-faith uh, background and identity. And what I mean by that is that in Albania, we intermarry quite a bit. So I have Orthodox in my family, Catholics, Muslims, and Jews, depending on where you look within the first two or three um, uh, layers of the family. And this has been a fascinating study uh, for me to conduct. Uh, I would say that I'm faithful, although I do not ascribe to any specific denomination or religion. My name is Brooke Zog, and I'm the vice president of the Faith and Media Initiative, and I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and a follower of, of Jesus Christ. And I am Mara Esquivel-Campo. I am a journalist. Um, I'm culturally Christian, uh, but I do not subscribe to religion, per se. I have more of the view that you do of broad spirituality. Um, so I'd like to start, Kurosh, with you, because you're based in Tehran. And this was a, I'm sorry, not Tehran, you're based in Iran, close to Tehran. And this was a global study. How do you see religion being covered differently in repressive countries versus countries with very strong press freedoms? Um, so let me start off by uh, honoring the memory of the 22-year-old Iranian woman uh, called Mahsa Amini, who was um, uh, under uh, mysterious circumstances actually killed uh, while in the custody of the morality police in Iran. Um, uh, she was seen um, on the street and uh, not to be dressing in the strictest way the Iranian government wishes and um, so they arrested her and uh, after a four day period of um, uh, hospitalization she finally succumbed to uh, her injuries and died. Uh, so this is one of the several instances of how um, uh, a misguided and extreme interpretation of the Sharia law and um, Islamic teachings and principles can um, actually bring about on uh, irrecoverable and irretrievable damages and basically uh, in this instance claim a civilian life and innocent life, a 22-year-old woman. And as of uh, right now we are speaking, uh, there are protests going on across the country with people staging demonstrations, uh, demanding uh, their right to uh, uh, claim justice and their uh, essential entitlement to uh, choose their dress codes. Um, this has been a fault line um, in Iran for the past four decades. Uh, but uh, not to digress that much, uh, I guess the portrayal of uh, religion in the media in Iran um, is totally different from um, what is perceived externally and uh, how the media, uh, in I mean the mainstream media internationally, react to episodes of uh, religious intolerance, violence. Uh, Iran is a theocratic uh, system of government and um, of course people are uh, obliged and uh, demanded to, I mean, subscribe to and follow certain uh, ideologies and to even, to some extent, adjust their lifestyle to what the government demands them. But uh, that's not the reality of a Muslim country. Uh, one of the mistakes that we sometimes make in uh, actually understanding communities of faith is that we consider them as monoliths and uh, equate uh, all of them with all of their nuances and differences, their cultural, um, societal um, backgrounds and their histories and their different uh, stories and whatever they have been through, that we, we equate them and we uh, actually tend to uh, treat them in simplistic ways while even a country like Iran in which 98% of the population is Muslim is not a monolith at all. Uh, there are people who are just practicing Islam because um, their families used to be practicing Muslims. There are, fam there are families uh, who have been disillusioned and dis, uh, uh, disenfranchised and uh, alienated with the concept of religion because of how uh, um, the government has uh, resorted to coercion to actually uh, implement its uh, religious ideologies. As a practicing Muslim, uh, I feel proud that I have made this decision, decision to be a Muslim myself. Uh, when I was uh, going to high school, my father uh, gave me a piece of advice and told me, if you follow these two uh, principles, you're going to succeed and excel in your education, your career, whatever you do. 
uh, don't smoke, don't lie. Uh, so uh, I follow the practice and uh, to some extent, uh, I mean, it has paid off. Uh, it's, it's not as simple as that, but it's speaking to a larger, a broader uh, uh, principle that, uh, I mean, Islam is uh, not uh, all about what we are seeing being displayed by the Taliban in Afghanistan or by the authorities in Iran. Um, Islam is about uh, charity, is about respect, is about uh, if you claim one life unduly, it's as if you have killed the entire humanity. Islam is about uh, to treat uh, um, whoever is in your family, whether it's a child, whether it's a woman, whether it's a man, uh, with, th with the same uh, spectrum of principles and values. And um, Islam is teaching me to even uh, be susceptible and open to learning from uh, my daughter who is eight years old. So it doesn't matter uh, if you're attending a university uh, class or you're talking to a child who is eight years old. Th there are things that they have to share and there are things that you can learn from them. So, um, I mean, when we fast during the holy month of Ramadan, uh, it's all about philanthropy. It's all about um, actually relating to the sentiments and feelings and experiences of those who do not have a meal on their table. So I guess um, these are the realities that have been with withheld and concealed from the public eye because of how, um, first, um, misguided the policies of ma many Muslim countries with uh, a stringent leaders have been, and also because of how uh, the corporate media decide to pro um, give coverage to faith issues. Um, I guess uh, we have to um, just distinguish between what uh, Islam as an ideology, as a lifestyle, as a culture is uh, teaching its followers and adherents to do, and what certain Muslim countries subscribing to an extreme version of political Islam are preaching and proselytizing. We can expand on that. I guess I haven't talked too much, but um, there's a lot to say about this coming from Iran, uh, a country with a rich uh, cultural civilization, with a rich and deep history, uh, which is not being represented well and uh, realistically because of uh, how we, uh, the people of Iran, and how the leadership in Iran are behaving. Simran, the media in general focuses heavily on conflict, whether it's in politics, whether it's crime coverage, whether it's war. How do you think that tendency towards conflict-based coverage affects coverage of spirituality and religion? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a good question, and it's an important question. Um, and, I, and I'll take us back to two very simple concepts that are culturally active for us right now. Uh, one is around representation. Um, what stories are being told effectively is what we're talking about with representation. Who are we seeing? And, and so typically, the reality in this country and around the world has been those in power are the ones who are considered normative, who have the power to tell the stories, and therefore are the ones who we see. They're the ones who are shown in, their, in the fullness and richness of their humanity. And what happens to everyone else? They're tokenized, right? If they're shown at all, you get single snapshots of who they are, and those tokenization representations are based on stereotypes, right? In America, that's the black man as violent. That's the Muslim as a terrorist. That's the immigrant as being a, a foreigner who cannot integrate, right? So many stereotypes, and, and we'll recognize them because they're true here, but they're true all over the world. These stereotypes are so constantly presented to us. And so then what happens when you don't have representations of these communities, and then we tell these stories on the basis of conflict? Right, a, a recent study, this is to pick up on, on Karusha's point, a recent study showed that although Muslims make up more than 25% of the world's population, only 10% of American films represent Muslims, only 2% of those are speaking roles, more than 50% of those who are represented as Muslim are tied to violence. Now let me, let me just sort of make a connection here based on my training as a scholar, which I, in 2016, we all remember that year, um, I started teaching Islamic studies in Texas. And what I found as my students walked into the classroom was that they had never learned a thing about Islam aside from what they had seen on the news or in movies or on TV. 
They knew nothing except for the stereotypes. And some of them, many of them knew that they were dehumanizing. They knew their perceptions were wrong, but they had nowhere else to go. I mean, where would they learn when it's not in the movies and the films and whatever it is that we consume culturally? And so what happens when the only representations of communities are on the basis of these stereotypes? And so many of these stereotypes are on the basis of dehumanizing representations, violence, conflict, et cetera. I mean, of, of course you're gonna end up in a situation where I walk down the street and people see me as a terrorist. I mean, what else do we expect in this country? Right, that's, there, there's a saying in our tradition, um, it says, um, you sow poison and you, accept, you expect nectar. You accept sweetness, like what, what are you doing? Like that makes no sense. And so I think it's, it's clear to anybody who's looking and to many of us who live through this, that the stories we're telling on the basis of conflict, on the basis of stereotypes, on the basis of violence, are putting us in positions where we are being dehumanized constantly. Like that's, that's the consequence, and, and it's a real consequence for many of us. So to that end, the need for more diversity, religious diversity in the media, Linus, do you think that religious diversity is an area that has been overlooked? And how do you actually put that into practice when many people feel very private about their faith in the workplace and many employers um, are very reticent to even inquire about it? All right, so um, I think the first thing to understand about religious diversity, especially from my own point of view now, is I will be taking this perspective from a continent that I know so well, which is Africa. And I happen to be one of the very few people on this panel who shuttles between both worlds. Um, the story is a little different on the continent. And I'll say this, you have a continent that pretty much is the large, it has the youngest population on the planet with 70% of people below the age of 30. Now, Nigeria, where I'm from, happens to have a population of over 200 million people. And we have a very strong Christian South and a strong Muslim North. But in several parts of Africa, what you would find is there is a very deep understanding about faith, a love for something that is beyond you. And you will, I'll give you an example. In Zambia, there is a national day for prayer, and it's actually a public holiday. In Kenya, there is a national day of prayer. It's not a public holiday. So you see that religion or faith, as we'll call it, has kind of acculturized itself with daily living. And so what you find there is people understanding how important or how serious faith is. Politicians and sometimes religious leaders, unfortunately, have played on these sentiments to create different types of divisions within the country. And so that is why there is a very strong need to mobilize our energies around educating people and why it is incredibly very important. And I really am so thankful for this platform that has been created because I think there is no better place where this type of conversations should be had than on the continent. Because that is a continent that has the potential for learning from all the challenges and inadequacies and shortcomings of our fellow folks in the West. When you have a population of so many young people whose minds require a different type of education, right? And they are susceptible to the kinds of information that they're being fed with on a daily basis, especially from the West. It's a kettle of gunpowder because what is going on, I mean, Horaj just talked about the, 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 the young lady who, the unfortunate incident of the young lady. There was a similar incident, even in Nigeria. First quarter of this year, a young girl who was in a university doing her work on a WhatsApp group, having a conversation, and then what happened? The message was misinterpreted, 
and she was killed. And then what you find is because of how important religion and faith is, so many people, including political leaders, were reticent about really talking about the issues because it could either go different ways. So to come back to one of the things that we decided to do earlier on about 10 years ago was to, we understood the power that culture plays and the entertainment industry. A lot of the conversations we've been hearing here today has been centered around news media. But the entertainment space happens to be the most powerful vo force on the continent of Africa. Nigeria happens to be one of the most, one of the strongest cultural entertainment cities on the continent and has influenced the whole of Africa and now even in the States with so many of them winning Grammy Awards. How do we use culture as a tool to create social change? And for a continent that is so young, this, there is no better time to use that particular platform to create the change that is needed on the continent. Thank you. Alyssa, when it comes to achieving religious diversity in the workplace in the United States, in the media, there's such a strong separation of church and state. And many people consider the media to be the fourth estate of government. So it would apply there. How do you achieve that religious diversity in, in the media in a way that still respects the principle of separating church and state? Or can you? Interesting question. So I, you know, on some level, it comes down to hiring. We know this, hiring practices. And there's, of course, ways in which we can't talk about that when we're in the hiring process. But I also want to think about it as a um, problem of failure of imagination. And I think this is an issue. Um, I cover Hollywood, so I know this is an issue in Hollywood and the movie business as well, which is that many times what we find is that the people who are in the positions of power um, don't see the bubble that they're in. Um, I've certainly experienced this, for instance, where I've pitched stories that I know for certain are going to be of interest to many, many people because often from my perspective, I'm writing about something in evangelical culture. Um, you know, maybe the person I'm pitching to just hasn't been involved with that and doesn't see why writing about this album from the 90s is actually a great way for us to talk about what's happening in the present. Um, but I know that many people have because many people grew up around this album. Many people grew up around evangelicals, right? This is not like a hard thing to talk about um, in America. Um, so, so often there's just this failure of imagination of how how could other people be interested in this? And so what it really comes down to in the workplace, I think, is that um, we need to listen more to people who are from a faith tradition other than our own or who have uh, touched it and know that the things that they bring up as culture attached to that religion, so not just the faith, but as the culture attached to that, um, are valuable. So if they s notice something going on that they feel is important for us to cover, um, not not thinking in terms of, oh, who, who will click on that, um, but instead thinking in terms of subject matter experts. And so that, that really matters. And then I think when we get to Hollywood, um, I, you know, we see the same thing. Most studio heads have, in my experience, like no idea that people are interested in religion other than in stories of conflict and things like that. And we see that changing a little bit here and there. Um, certainly the independent film world is very interested in religion. You see a very large representation of um, different faiths and different experiences in documentaries or if you go to Sundance or something, you'll see a lot of that. Um, but still, the people who are making the decisions with the money don't uh, see that there's a market there. And, and the entertainment business is just a business. It's just a market. And so they're not aware um, often, or they discount the idea that there might be a market for this. So I'm thinking of a couple shows. Um, I just finished watching last night um, a delightful show that is uh, on Peacock in the US called We Are Lady Parts. It's a British show. And I don't know if any of you have seen it, but um, it is about five Muslim women in England who have a band. And it's a fictional show. Um, but each of them represents a much wider diversity of Islam than I think I've ever seen on television. And the show was extremely well reviewed by critics. And everyone who watches it loves it. And that's the kind of thing that I think we need more of. Um, we need entertainment executives and producers who have a vision for the idea that religion isn't just some weird stapled on thing to people's lives that we just stick in the side character when we need them to like walk on and say a wise thing. 
Um, but we actually, this is fundamental to people's lives and that, pe that creators who maybe are interested in creating a show or creating a movie um, might actually be worth taking a risk on. I, I was talking to some friends who are religion reporters um, over dinner a few weeks ago and we were like, why isn't there a version of The Office set in a Midwest megachurch? <laughs> It's perfect. It's perfect, and we immediately pitched an entire season just sitting there. Um, of you know, it's got everything you need for that kind of sitcom. Um, there's a, there are ways to do this that can subtly, I think, um, as Linus was saying, they can kind of subtly start to change perceptions, or perhaps people people who are within those traditions can see themselves reflected in a way they didn't before. There's all these opportunities that are honestly just laying on the table. And I've been in conversations with people both on the news media side and on the entertainment media side um, who, are, who say, you know, we really want to connect with people of faith. We want to, like, you know, find their stories and, and find ways to help tell them and connect with communities of faith. And what they run up against a lot of the time, which is what was sort of found in this study, is a distrust that you only want to tell our stories um, because, you know, you're going to make fun of us or you're going to paint us as one, one kind of character. And that is uh, earned mistrust, but the way to overcome it is to keep trying um, and not to sort of lose interest in telling those stories. Um, and so we, you know, as a result, we see a vast array of different kinds of stories about people of faith being told, but we don't, um, we could see a lot more there are a lot more people of faith in the world than you would think just by watching American TV. I would definitely watch your show, by the way, the mega, the mega church comedy. I think this is a really good idea. <laughs> I agree. You run NBC, come talk to me. <laughs> um, I'd like to pivot to the business world. Uh, Davis, how can business leaders create an environment where employees feel comfortable bringing their whole authentic self to work, including their religion, while also respecting those who want to be private about their spirituality yeah this is this is a big challenge for ceos uh so i run a, a business uh i mentioned it before but called cotopaxi uh we're a b corp a business committed to doing good in the world and um we value diversity uh a lot and but one of the aspects of diversity that i think really matters um is religious diversity as well and um you know, we hired, uh, in the last year, we hired a, a senior executive that joined our team, and um, she was talking to me in, like, her first day of work as she's being onboarded, and um, she lives on the East Coast. I live in Salt Lake City, and she said, hey, you know, I, I know you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I, I just kind of want to understand how you separate your religion from work. And I don't think you could ask that question about someone else's race or their gender identity. It's like, how do you separate your gender identity from your work? Or how do you separate your race from your work? But it's, it's interesting how that's acceptable when you're talking about someone's religion. And um, my answer was that I don't. I, it's impossible for me to separate. It's part of who I am. I can't separate my, my religion, my faith, with the work I do professionally. And it's, it's deeply impacted the business that we're building. Um, you know, I, I love that we're in a world that's becoming more and more inclusive. Um, you know, people put pronouns on the end of their names and um, to identify who they are. And I think we have a little bit of ways to go when it, when it comes to religion. Even the way we started this conversation was like, it was like, you know, this wouldn't be appropriate anywhere else. And I understand why you say it, because it, it almost doesn't feel appropriate because we've been trained that it's not. But I just don't see why. I, if it's, it's part of who we are. And if we want to create a place where people can come to work as their full selves, um, whether they're uh, part of the LGBTQ community or whether it's a race or whatever, we should also need to make sure that religion is included in that. Um, you know, as a CEO, we feel increasing pressure to, to voice our, our opinions and our brand's opinions on social issues. And, um, you know, young, young generations, we know that millennials, Gen Zs, um, they are less connected to organized religion. They're less connected to institutions in general. And a lot of times they're looking for work to provide purpose and mission in a way that previous generations looked at their religion or their church to do that. And so as a business leader, I definitely feel that, a, a pressure of creating purpose and, 
for people. And, um, you know, for me, I talk openly. What I found is that I talk openly about my beliefs and um, understand. And there's a way to do that in a re very respectful way. Um, and I found people actually are curious about how that's how my faith has impacted my leadership. Uh, I was on a podcast uh, called How I Built This with Guy Raz from NPR. And um, we, we had a four, the podcast was a four hour interview. They cut it down to one hour. Uh, but we spent about 45 or 50 minutes talking about religion. And he brought it up to me. He wanted to know all about the two years that I spent as a missionary, how that prepared me to be a CEO, to handle, and an entrepreneur, how, th how that prepared me to handle rejection. And, um, you know, it was a really fascinating conversation. And a lot of that was included in the podcast. And, um, you know, that was, that was done uh, two and a half years ago. I get I get messages daily on LinkedIn, um, random messages from people saying, I just listened to the podcast. I'm from whatever faith. I'm so glad that you were comfortable enough to talk about your faith. And so um, I found that people are interested in this. And I think by leading by example as a leader and having the courage to talk about something that really matters to me deeply, it gives opportunities for those in our company that are of other faiths as well to talk about their faith, to, to include that as part of who they are. You mentioned that you spent a few years as a missionary. Where? Yeah, I, I was in Bolivia. Um, and uh, I actually grew up, when I was four years old, my family moved to Latin America. My dad had been a, a, a missionary when he was 19 to 21, and then later on started his career, professional career. And because he spoke Spanish, we moved to Latin America. So I, I grew up in Latin America. Uh, when I started Cotopaxi, I actually moved uh, to the United States from Brazil. Um, so uh, I have a deep connection in the United States, but also in Latin America, where, where faith is a little more open there. Um, I found that it's quite different here in the United States than it was there. David, businesses are about making money. They're not nonprofits. What's the business case for increasing and enhancing coverage of faith and religion in the media? First, if I could be so rude, let me slightly disagree with even how you framed the question. Businesses need to make money to survive, but they also need to provide goods and services to the world. And most businesses, I think, get that, particularly small and medium-sized uh, family enterprises and so forth, but even the, even the big, uh, big corporations. So, but to the thrust of your question, what's the business model for this conversation that we're having and what FAMI is all about, the Faith and Media Initiative? So let's do a thought experiment. Pretend all of you are a CEO of a media outlet you're shaking your head, right, Oman? Pretend, pretend you're the CEO of a media outlet, and I'm coming in to pitch something to you. And I come in and say, would you be interested in a product that reaches over 84% of the globe's population? You have 84% of the globe as potential clients, customers, buyers, clickers, eyeballs. Yep, tick, I'm interested, tell me more. What if you then said, and this is right in the sweet spot for diversity, equity, and inclusion. It just nails it. It hits it out of the park, the DEI metrics. Yeah, tell me more. And you know what? People are really interested because there's no competitors out there. You'll be first to market. Well, there's a few competitors, but frankly, they're kind of lousy. Sorry. Uh, but you, you could just take this to a whole new plane. By now, I'm really leaning forward saying, tell me more. Let me bring in my B VP of business development or whatever it is. And of course, then the reveal, the reveal. It's talking about spirituality, faith, religion, in ways that are inviting, that are thoughtful, that are intriguing, even humorous at times. Because let's face it, whether you're Sikh or Muslim or Jew or LDS or whatever, we all bleed, we all have family problems, we all get sick, we all laugh, we all like community, we all like to eat, drink, whatever. So. We're, we're, there's a story to tell here, or stories, plural. And, and I would go further if the conversation got a little bit deeper, if they're actually saying, yeah, to, to tell me how to do this. I'd say you might break your categories of coverage into two categories. One, and this is kind of me using the, the theological language, uh, one is orthodoxy and one is orthopraxy. So orthodoxy means right belief. So whatever your tradition says, and we realize even within traditions there's disagreements of, of what the correct belief is. But one would have an educational component. So you could learn about your neighbor and people that you don't know anything about and their backgrounds. And that could be, wow, a service to society, like a couple 
that you have said, because if you, if, where else are we gonna learn this? Because we don't learn it in our colleges and our high schools. The other part, orthopraxis, that means right practice. So how do you show up? How does your faith make, if at all, a difference in how you conduct your affairs? So there could be amazing human interest stories from the corporate world, and, and not just sort of church stories or temple stories or synagogue stories, but from where people live and what they do. I, I think the potential is huge, it's rich. You have to think it through, you have to hire the right people. Like any new business development, you have to put money into R&D, so you, you can't just take the, uh, another journalist who has a different beat and say, we want you to do this now, unless that person is supremely talented. I think it's it's very exciting. Uh, so that's our thought experiment. And, and I, I think you'd close a lot of deals if you had the chance to talk to the right people. Thank you. So then, Anna, what tools and resources would be needed to improve coverage? Let's say he comes to you, he pitches you, you say, great, I'm on board. What are the tools and resources that are needed to provide this enhanced Let's do it, coverage? Anna. Oh, wow. So you're going to have me design the plan, huh? I see. OK, great. I'll do a draft. Uh, <laughs> you can mark it up and fix it. <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, I have to say, and then, it, it, that's, that's a great question. And yes, I 100% I, I agree with, with what you're saying, you know, in a in a in a in a former in a former costume change, I was the head of diversity for Starwood Hotels and Resorts, um, which happened to have at one time owned this property we're sitting in, and it's the same conversation with diversity as it is with this, right? What is the business case? It's not. It's not. It's not tough. It's you've got 84, 85 percent of the world out there that says we have a connection to faith religion, spirituality, okay? On the other side, you've got media outlets, whether they're entertainment or full-on news, that for the most part now are all publicly traded. They're multi-million dollar businesses. They happen to say news or entertainment on them, but they're multi-million dollar publicly traded companies. So, I mean, to bridge that, it's do you want to reach your public or not, or do you want to alienate your public? Most of Christianity has gone out there. Most faith-based um, individuals have gone out there and started their own publications, their own media outlets, because they don't like the stereotypes that are being um, um, perpetuated in entertainment or media about them. So what tools? I say start with diversity training. Number one. Number two, I, I think that words matter, and not not to be rude or disrespectful, but the term separation of church and state does not apply in business. The separation of church and state is exactly that. The state, the government, the church, the church. That has nothing to do with what we do in privately owned businesses. And I think we have to do a little bit of a cleansing of the language that we use which when I was in the DEI world, that's part of the training that we did is, you know, in the beginning was the word, and the word becomes life, and our words have power. And so I think that's one of the tools is how, how do we speak about um, this and in how we learn to uh, speak to one another about our beliefs, we start making each other comfortable uh, with, how, with how we speak. And, and I do want to address another thing. The thought that news and entertainment, that ship has sailed. News has become entertainment. I, one, of, one of the classes I teach is the practice of public relations. And when I have my students do um, these PR assessments to get them thinking in a certain way, you know, I, I try to define to them, okay, bring me news, okay? I don't want to know what Bad Bunny did last night. I need you to bring me news, right? Um, but but it's that it's it's that sense of of if it's not negative, like we were talking about, then it's not going to be covered. And if it is covered, then it's in a negative way. And then how do we get around that? And I think it goes back to the training. It, it has to start there because I think it first starts with a DEI issue. We are it, it is that far behind, in my opinion. What what I'm seeing. I hope that that's helpful. 
Um, I do want to get to solutions, and I would love uh, Brooke and Dutan to lead that conversation. So we're going to get to that in just a minute, but I do want to take a, do a couple more questions. Feel free to jump in because you know there's such a great panel, so many amazing perspectives, and we just have a few more minutes till we'll shift to solutions. Um, Karosh, many would argue that the mainstream media reinforces this east-west civilizational divide. How do you think the media can have the reverse effect? How can they work to bridge the gap? That's absolutely correct, and that's the reality of our time, that uh, the mainstream media, the corporate media, driven by certain interests, driven by uh, the agendas of their owners, are actually perpetuating the hostility that has been bred and reproduced, especially since the 9-11 attacks in the United States. Um, I guess uh, the global rise of Islamophobia is to some extent attributable to um, how the Muslim leaders are conducting themselves at home and overseas and also uh, to how um, the media are portraying um, Islam and other faith communities. Islam is in particular um, uh, prominent here because there are uh, leaders with ambitions to actually embrace uh, the idea of political Islam, to uh, blend and combine their statecraft and leadership practices with Islamic thought and Islamic uh, values, which isn't working actually. And we are seeing the failed experience of Iran um, and the failed experience of, uh, I mean, it's not being uh, done in the same way in Turkey, but even the people of Turkey are protesting the, the, uh, the religious motives behind President Erdogan's um, push to actually uh, proselytize Islamic thought and values in, in the society. Uh, but why uh, the media are doing this and how they can uh, reverse the role? Uh, first, we should uh, understand that uh, as media people, are, I mean, personally as a journalist, I have done several stories about different faith communities, including Muslims and others. I have uh, in a setting in which it's not really favorable to the authorities to talk about religious minorities because they want to make sure that uh, Islam is a dominant narrative. I have written articles about anti-Semitism being uh, from, uh, pro proclaimed and proselytized by the Iranian authorities. I have written articles about the community of Zoroastrians in Iran being a forgotten minority because that was the birthplace of the first monotheistic uh, religion in the world. And now the majority of them have already left the country and are looking for, for their prospects and their well-being in other places, including India, in, in which there is a very flourishing and thriving community of Parsis or Zoroastrians. So I guess uh, as media people, as journalists, as um, media owners, as media managers, practitioners, we should first start uh, initiating a conversation with people, people who practice different faiths to understand that each of them have got a certain story to narrate and to retell, and, and these stories need to be shared. Uh, when we treat societies as uh, monoliths, like I said in my previous response, uh, we uh, often uh, actually run the risk of uh, miscalculating and misjudging uh, their ideologies, their values, uh, what they stand for, what they represent. So I guess uh, we should have more uh, reporters, more correspondents trained um, who are able to dis distance themselves and detach themselves from their own biases and prejudices to go to countries to talk to people, to uh, share their stories. Uh, I mean, uh, not so many people in Iran, uh, not, not so many people know in the world about what uh, young Iranians are doing to uh, at the same time, reassert their religious identity re and reconcile it with their national identity about which they're very proud. And at the same time, be secular minded, be liberal, uh, live a life which they see is the lived experience of their peers in countries neighboring Iran, surrounding the country. They, they travel to Turkey, they travel to UAE as their uh, popular destination and they come back to Iran and they say, okay, why is it that different? Uh, are we not all Muslim? So, uh, what does that stem from? So I guess um, we need um, more dedicated, professional, and um, unbiased coverage by uh, professional reporters who are dedicated to, to, to the truth, who want to debunk their stereotypes to finally um, make the decision that, okay, this uh, generational and civilizational divide between East and the West, between the Muslim world and the West needs to be bridged at some point, it needs to be addressed. And uh, then, I mean, uh, 
people-to-people -people exchanges to um, feature voices that haven't been heard that much, that aren't all over the mainstream media. And they are valid and they're authentic. Uh, in, in the mainstream media's coverage of Iran, for example, there are not so many authentic voices coming out of Iran. Most of the Iran experts that you have got in think tanks in DC and New York, in London, even don't speak Persian, which means they don't understand the country that much. So, uh, I mean, uh, we all need to uh, come to this conclusion that at some point this, uh, and again, I should uh, certainly um, reaffirm that this is partly to a great extent the responsibility of uh, governments in our part of the world to, re to correct their practices. When you uh, reproduce for several years and decades a slogan that is wishing death to a different country, when you put the flag of a different country on fire, and do all of these vile and uh, repugnant practices under the name of Islam, uh, then it's quite, uh, I mean, natural that people will develop a hostility to your faith, to your uh, community, to your values, to your views, and to what you stand for. So I guess um, part of it is political decisions that need to be made, a determination, for example, by Muslim leaders in my country and elsewhere in the Muslim world, that uh, the path to uh, reconciliation between the East and the West uh, needs to be traveled through um, honest, fruitful conversations. Uh, the, and, and, and for them to uh, stop reproducing hostilities, the part that needs to be uh, uh, under, under, under undertaken by the mainstream media is that they need to train their correspondents to be able to detach themselves from their biases and to report uh, stories that are being uh, withheld and not uh, commonplace. Um, I mean, um, the majority of what uh, many of us have heard about Iran is about its nuclear program. So there are different sides to a country uh, which we don't hear about. These need to be covered and there needs to be dialogue incubated and that kind of uh, facilitates. Um, it, uh, it's one of the first steps and uh, then I guess we can get to a point that the East-West uh, divide starts to be uh, just to make a, a quick comment, and Linus, I was triggered by something you said earlier about the, the young continent and the, the large number of youth, and I don't think we've really talked yet about the younger people. And your survey uh, uh, had, if I recall, 23% uh, of the surveyed population were 18 to uh, 34 years old. Mm -hmm. So I look at my students, of, which was 10% of your survey, uh, that are 18 to 24, and they're really interested in this thing. They're curious. They're hungry. This this whole topic. That in fact, they'd probably be my my, some of my students. They'd probably be laughing at us. Like, well, no kidding, Sherlock. Like, this is this is what we want. We yearn to have honest conversations. They don't have the the baggage that I think the certainly the the the, the, the greatest generation and the you know, the baby boomers. They don't have that baggage. They want to live an integrated life. They aren't afraid to talk about God or spirituality or faith. And also the atheists and agnostics are interested in this too. I, I surveyed my students. That it's, I teach a course called Business Ethics Succeeding Without Selling Your Soul. That was the student's nickname for it. And so I just gave it the name. Uh, and and I, I look at ethics through the lens not just of law like we usually do or not just through the lens of secular moral philosophies, but I look at it through the, uh, for scope and scale reasons, through religious traditions focusing on the three Abrahamic, saying what does Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have to say about leadership, ethics, decision making, how you treat the other, what fair trade looks like, and so forth. And about 18 to 22 percent, I survey my students about their self-described uh, identity anon anonymously, and 18 to 24 percent are to self-described as atheists or agnostics, and they're signing up for an elective class. I never would have done that when I was in college. So, so somewhere in this mix, I think we need to turn to uh, the, the Z's and the new generation to say, help us think this through, because they're also the ones that are going to have the big pocketbooks pretty soon. So but I, I David, just wanted to throw can, that in the mix. If I can follow up on that, how do you then reconcile that with the fact that people are increasingly moving away from organized religion, and there's also increasing distrust in religious institutions? Yeah, and I think that the key word is institutions. If we look at Edelman trust barometers, uh, all the big institutions, government, uh, uh, they're in decline in trust, and certainly religious ones. And why? Because, sadly, the media, to generalize, says, what is it, 60 plus percent of the stories are scandalous, they're salacious. And the youth, the, I, they don't like um, falseness. They don't like uh, um, posers. They don't like hypocrites. Uh, 
they don't mind disagreeing with you, but they, they want to trust you. So I think if you move from the institution to what, what is the belief that people are actually talking about? Who is Muhammad and who are the great thinkers and who was Jesus? They're interested in that question. What did they have to say? Don't give me the institutional um, shtick, if you will. So I, I think the, a fresh approach needs to be taken, and I think they'll help us figure that out. Yeah, I, I was gonna. I was just gonna say that, David. What I what I'm finding in my students and my own teenage daughter is, they're not looking for religion, which is the institution. They're looking for relationship, which is the person, whatever that person is that represents that belief, whether it's God, Jesus Christ, Muhammad, whatever, whatever it is. They're like. You know, whatever, and, and I hear this, whatever you all did with that, that's not working. So I'm going to kind of come over here and focus directly on, on, on the person. So, I, I mean, I, I hear that from my students also. And the Edelman Trust Barometer, which is something that I bring in every year in class, um, media is up there with government on the top two that nobody trusts because of the scandal, because of the lack of authenticity. And guess who's replaced the two of them in that, in that barometer with the number one institution that most of the world trusts? It's business. Business leaders, exactly. It's business leaders. So now people are looking to business leaders to say, you know what, we're looking at you to fill that societal void, what are you gonna do about the environment and what are you gonna do about all these other social problems? So I think there's an opportunity, I'm saying that because I think there's an opportunity also at work now vis-a-vis -vis DEI to say, let's talk about our faith more because it is fundamental to who we are as people and like Davis, I mean, I am who I am all the time. I don't separate the fact that I'm Cuban or an immigrant or that I'm a Christian when I walk in the door at work. And to make something. And I think so, Linus, and then I think Alyssa, you had a comment on this, and then I would love to turn to solutions. All right, great. So, what what is really very important here, and I think the operating word here is these young people. And I, I really think that we, everyone in this room, should really pay attention to what is really going on in that part of the world and even here as well, because. The consumption is happening on a daily basis. We're consuming all types of things. We're feeding our flesh with stuff, but our spirits are being fed with things that are coming out from places sometimes we do not understand their origins. And this is, this. I the understanding I had about the United States, for example, I grew up in Lagos, right? From a very remote place in Lagos. And everything I knew about what the United States looked like or some beautiful buildings and all of that came from what I saw in Hollywood movies. Everything. Our minds were framed by the things that we saw on television. Right? And when I think about my son and what he watches sometimes, I go sometimes to him to watch with him because he's being fed with loads of information on a daily basis and there's no leadership to guide or mobilize the energies in the right direction. So if we have an opportunity to create something that helps us begin to curate the types of stories that would help build the minds of these people. I think it's something that we should begin to pay a lot of attention to. Like I mentioned in Nigeria, for example, in the business community, you find that for the first time, but well, not even the first time, you, you find people start off business meetings with prayers in most parts of Africa. Business meetings are started with prayers. I mean, I've not seen, I, I can hardly think of some countries here or um, within this hemisphere that actually do that. So the, the, the question is, that is not a major problem for the, that's such a young continent. It is what is coming out. And what we decided to do about 10 years ago was to build an infrastructure that would help produce the types of movies that would help reorientate our minds and give them a better sense of what religion is and what faith is and how they can use that as a tool to help move themselves forward. Hallmark television TV, we used to watch it, it was a family entertainment TV for most Africans. When it was taken off, a lot of us did not, on, we didn't have an alternative to what to watch, right? So it, it, this is a very passionate um, 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 topic for me because every single thing that we do is centered around what we're consuming and that is what is resulting in the things that we are producing out. You see a lot of, lots of folks who are in drug, drug and crime related issues. Medicine 
to an extent cannot solve those problems. They get into depression. I have a very good friend of mine whose daughter is suffering from chronic depression. And why? Because of drugs. But until she's a different, they, they moved from country to country looking for all types of medication for that ailment until they found someone who sat with her and began to speak a different language to her about her faith and about a different sense of spirituality. And I tell you today, she's a totally different person. So I think there should be a lot of attention paid to this, and I think it will go a very long way for us. Melissa? I just briefly wanted to say that I've been teaching for uh, undergraduates for 13 years at a college that primarily draws uh, students from evangelical backgrounds. And um, part of one of the courses I teach on postmodernism is talking about um, the postmodern condition being partly that your religious, um, your faith is uh, embodied by your lived experience and not by assenting to a list of rules or propositions. And when I first started teaching, they were young millennials and they basically didn't know what I was talking about. And now they tend to understand it. Um, and if there's one thing, and I believe that's why a lot of them who go to church regularly and read their Bibles and pray and all of this stuff still would tell you that they are not a uh, part of organized religion, which they obviously are, but for them, they just don't want to be connected with that thing over there. And so, um, so one thing that art is really good at doing is embodying lived experience. And that's why I really appreciate whenever I run across art that uh, embodies the lived experiences of people from religious traditions other than mine, um, because it doesn't tell me what they believe, but it tells me what it is to be them. And that's what art does best. So then looking ahead, Brooke, I'm going to start with you. And then Jutan, I would love your thoughts on this as well. What specific things can be done to improve coverage and who is doing coverage well right now? And, and that, I would like to hear from the two of them, but at some point, I, if any of you have notable outlets or individuals who you think are doing a really good job, um, I think it's important to look to those as well. If I could just bring back to one point, um, when we were working with Driton to get the data that they had worked on, on this global study, which was really exciting, it was at the time that the, peanut, the queen had passed away. And I quickly looked at an article that had a quote from her that talked about herself, but as an institution saying, any institution that expected loyalty should also expect criticism. And I think that it's important that the Faith and Media Initiative is recognizing that both faith, religious institutions, and media institutions are actually incredibly valuable to society, that they bring tremendous good, um, and that both would be um, should expect some criticism and look at ways that they can improve. And I think that when we tackled the survey with Harris X, it was, our customer survey, like customer success survey of how are we doing and how can we do better? And because ultimately that's who these two institutions are serving is people. And it's, it's, it's wanting. And I think what was really exciting for me, not only it validated things that we believed or thought to be true, um, but it also shined a light on opportunities for more and better. And it included solutions and ideas for both faith and media. And 85%, and somebody asked me earlier this morning what was surprising, and I think it was 84, 85% said that faith needs to show up and tell more meaningful lived experiences. And Alyssa, you talked about that. Um, I think that it is the responsibility of religious institutions and individuals to share and tell their stories and to become a resource and to talk about why this is important. And I think also what I really enjoyed or I thought valuable from the data that the Harris Group provided was not only were they saying we want more and better, but they were giving specifics of what kind of, what more and better meant. And that was diverse experiences, diverse stories. It was complex stories. We talked about hard news and soft news and soft news is certainly important. It's lifestyle, it's feel good. But where does faith play a role in the Ukraine war, what, is, what role does it play in the Great Resignation? Like the, these, these are critical topics that are important and relevant to the themes of today's conversations. So complex, diverse, and also protector of, protector of instead of per, um, perpetuating stereotypes and that there is a tremendous cost um, to perpetuating misinformation about people. And it, that, that lived experience varies based on where you live. In some places, it costs you your life. And in other places, it makes you afraid or causes anxiety. But I think that um, we all acknowledge that as both faith and media, there's an opportunity to do more and better. And my goal um, as representative of the Faith and Media Initiative is we really are trying to broker 
collaborative conversations between these two institutions to better understand each other. And we were at a round table earlier yesterday when we were talking about this with environment and media, and that before, they, for a long time, they didn't speak. And now that they are, they were strange bedfellows, and now that they are intimately connected. And I think the same is true and necessary for both faith and media institutions to come together, broker more healthy conversations. We are doing that from the faith and media perspective in terms of trying to facilitate these very, very important conversations of people who are out in the world doing this in very meaningful ways, um, influencing uh, companies and individuals and students for more and better. We're look so we're looking at building coalitions. We're looking at how can we support more trainings and workshops. We've been had great learnings from companies like Pointer Institute and Media Diversity Institute, not only to train media how to know and understand the nuances of faith, but also faith leaders how to understand and work with media and what are they looking for and how can I show up to help them. We're also looking, I think it's incredibly important, modeling, how can we recognize and spotlight those are doing it well. We did some on the interviews that you guys saw earlier on, we were asking people, and some of you are in the room today, stories that they remembered seeing where they did get it right. And they talked about um, Touched by an Angel or MASH where they saw a figure that represented them or um, so I think that modeling or showing, recognizing people who are doing it well um, is a, and, and training and, and conversations like this. And then I think also ongoing research and data to inform how can we do better, where can we do better, um, trend spotting and op identifying opportunities. So I'd say for me, those are kind of the, the pillars for, for improvement. Dutan, who's getting it right? Well, in this study specifically, we didn't want to uh, have readers rank the sources that they read, but I will tell you that from the perspective of the direct interviews that we did in 17 plus countries with representatives from the journalistic world, they themselves would say that no one is getting it right. Um, what was surprising was the degree of acknowledgement that this is an issue also surprising was the resignation which they offered to it. This is the new reality. These are the newsroom economics. This is how the social media algorithms work and what can we do about it. And I think that this is where the study, as Brooke mentioned, is very valuable because it does point the way to several solutions. There is a set of core themes here, transparency and openness from both faith organizations to uh, provide people and representatives with lived experiences rather than spokespeople with talking points, but also transparency within the newsroom, right? What is the process uh, that occurs to treat faith and religious uh, uh, stories? Most newsrooms do not make that available. In fact, we spoke to a senior editor, formerly of Bloomberg, that would say that um, faithful editors used to meet in secret to discuss religious and faith-related uh, 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 angles about stories because they did not want to be labeled and they did not want to be seen by their peers as introducing bias into the coverage or into the conversation because how do you speak about faith and religion? You need to speak from your own experience, from the experience of who's being affected by the story and also from the perspective of society. So transparency and on openness are two core themes. To David's point, you know, some risk taking is very much needed. This is big business. Um, but unfortunately, no one is actually focused on it. And you know, you have one third of respondents across the globe saying that they regularly access uh, faith-related news sources, specifically uh, faith-related news sources, and that number is as high as 47%, uh, much higher in more faithful, more religious countries like the United States or Nigeria or um, uh, South Africa. Um, and um, I would say that um, the last point uh, really is around the conversation. We were speaking with a journalist who said, well, what were you hoping to accomplish with this? Do you expect this to be some kind of road to Damascus, the conversion of St. Paul the Apostle? And um, me and uh, 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 my colleague from the Faith and Media uh, Initiative who were answering the journalist said, you know, our ambition was not uh, the road to Damascus is that great, but our ambition was to provide a mirror. There is a literary genre from the Renaissance called the mirror of princes. Today's news media, today me media of any kind, powers the global public square. It's the necessary infrastructure for information to go from point A to point B. 
sometimes well, sometimes badly, but it is and it will always exist. And by sourcing these findings without editorializing in the words of journalists and in the words of their readers in these countries, the hope is that there will be a conversation around this. And you know, I think that if people start picking apart at the findings, then that would be a great day because there's a lot there to like, there's a lot there to dislike, there's a lot there that's constructive and that also points to challenges. So I think that that's kind of my perspective on that. On uh, I'm gonna let you have the last word on that. I see our clock is ticking. Um, as a TV girl, I get anxiety when we get to the <laughs> last few seconds. Um, where can people see the full study? Brooke? Yeah, so, uh, sorry, uh, index.faithandmedia.com. We have a high level summary of it. We've got the video that was shared today in a longer form with some additional vignettes, but then we also have Dritan's and Harris X's data report available to you there. Thank you to our panel. This was a great conversation. Thank you for your time and perspective. Thank you.